Good afternoon. On behalf of the Inter-American Development Bank, we welcome you to the event, Superheroes from Suriname. How does one manage a project that strengthens the entrepreneurial ecosystem? Introductory remarks will be made by IDB President Mauricio Claver Carone, followed by a program introduction by Gonzalo Rivas, Chief of the Competitiveness, Technology and Innovation Division. This event will be held in English and Spanish with interpretation. Please click on the world icon at the bottom of your screen and select the language you want to hear. Para escuchar el evento en español, haga clic en el icono del mundo que encontrará en la parte baja de su pantalla y seleccione el idioma que desea escuchar. And now, remarks from President Claver Carone. Thank you for joining me. As you know, when a new development project comes to life, it is typically presidents and ministers who show up for the photo op and get media coverage. Yes, that's self-criticism. By contrast, the people who work day in and day out to make the project possible typically keep a low profile. The IDB launched the Superheroes of Development, an award to give credit and visibility to the unsung heroes of development in order to recognize the executing units that actually do the hard work of implementing projects in the face of all kinds of obstacles. This webinar is part of our effort to showcase the success stories of our counterparts. And today, we're focusing on a superhero in the Caribbean region, specifically in Suriname. Many of you have heard me talk about the importance of global value chains and nearshoring. You've also heard me talk about the need for gender empowerment. And I've always been a strong proponent of entrepreneurism and jobs. This project brings all of that together, and that's why I'm super excited. Tanya Luo So and her cooperative, which is made up of rural women, took a traditional Surinamese agricultural product, cassava, and created something with more value. Their smoked cassava porridge is sold to niche markets in Suriname and the Netherlands. With support from the IDB and the Japanese fund, they were able to expand their production of cassava products and upgrade their production facility. They received training and obtained quality certifications, which gave them access to new export opportunities. And they traveled to trade fairs in Holland to identify buyers and to market their product. Thanks to a successful marketing campaign, cassava porridge is now available in 100 supermarkets. Tanya and her cassava cooperative turned a crisis into an opportunity. They now export to Europe and North America, and they are taking advantage of the growing preference for gluten-free foods. I would also like to welcome Elizabeth Vasquez, co-founder and CEO of We Connect International. She's the author of the book, Buying for Impact, How to Buy from Women and Change the World. And she'll talk to us about how to empower women business owners to succeed in global markets. So welcome to what I know will be a fascinating conversation. I'm looking forward to it. And I hope you'll be inspired by the work of these women, which is improving lives in Suriname and beyond. Thank you so much. Um, thank you for those remarks, uh, Mauricio. As you mentioned, this project touches on a number of key uh, areas for the bank. And as uh, the chief uh, of the competitiveness technology and innovation division within the bank, I can confirm that this project also exemplifies a number of priority areas at the center of the work of our division and obviously of the bank. So it's a pleasure to be moderating the session this morning along with our distinguished group of speakers. And as Mauricio alluded to, we think that this will be an exciting session for all those participating. Uh, without further ado, I would like to introduce our next speaker, uh, Mr. Sio Shimizu, the Executive Director for the Chair of Croatia, Japan, Korea, Portugal, Slovenia, and United Kingdom at the IDB. Mr. Shimizu, please. Buenas tardes, uh, Mauricio Seris uh, in Gonzalo. Buenas uh, buenas tardes a todos. Uh, it is a great pleasure for me to be here this afternoon. Uh, for more than 30 years, Japan has contributed more than $400 million in grant through the Japanese trust funds at the IDB. We are glad that the, since its inception, Japan has supported all of the uh, 26 borrowing member countries covering all sectors, for example, the social sector, infrastructure, disaster prevention, environment, and pro, uh, productive activities. We are pleased that Japan's Granito de Arena 
has been uh, producing huge impact for the people in the region. Today, we are discussing, we, are, we will discuss the global value chains in the Caribbean and the innovative project in Suriname financed by Japan. It is my greatest pleasure that the project won the 2020 Development Superheroes Award. The project provides innovative tools and methodologies adapted to the current pandemic environment and trains female farmers virtually on the value chains of the cassava production and related products, such as baby food. Due, uh, due to the project's focus on training in good agricultural practices and good hygiene uh, practices, new production pro uh, processes were adapted by the uh, women during the past year. In addition, we are seeing product innovation, such as the development of three baby weaning child formulas made from a cassava base, as well as the gluten-free pancake mix formula for the Dutch market. So far, approximately 400 women from indigenous and maroon communities in the district of uh, Procobondo or Marowaine and Shibariwini are generating income thanks to the production of cassava. As a donor, we are glad that innovation is used to improve the uh, livelihood of uh, variable commodity, community, uh, vulnerable communities and that sustainable solutions are offered to alleviate poverty. In particular, we are pleased to be able to empower the pillars of Suriname, the Surinamese women who are working hard every day to improve their family lives and their communities. Thank you very much. Muchas gracias. Thank you, Mr. Director, and thank you also for the great work that's been done throughout the region with the support of the Japan Poverty Reduction Fund. Uh, as the chief of this division, I, I really attest that uh, you are helping us a lot to do, particularly on projects on, with social, social innovation. So now it's a pleasure to me, uh, for me to introduce our next speaker, uh, the IDB General Manager for the Caribbean, uh, Mrs. Therese Turner Jones. Therese, please. Thank you, Gonzalo. <clears throat> it's really great afternoon. And I hope everybody is as excited as, as I am about this particular event, not just because it focuses on women, but it focuses on an indigenous product, cassava, which everybody in the Caribbean knows. And it just goes to show that when we put our minds together, actually women can solve most problems in the world if only there were more of us in leadership positions, uh, but this is a really fantastic opportunity. I wanna thank the president, uh, Mauricio, for his remarks. And also we're especially grateful to the executive director for Japan for giving his remarks and the Japanese trust fund, as, as Gonzalo mentioned, has been particularly helpful uh, for the Caribbean region. So um, we Uma Fan Fu, Saran, which in Surinamese means we the women of Suriname. And I promise you, I won't try to pronounce it again because it's really complicated, but I'm so happy that it has that Surinamese name and it's very much um, a, a very powerful name, we the women of Suriname. And this is your story. I'm glad that Tanya is here along with her team to, to share in this, this afternoon with us to talk about how they've been able to take this traditional Surinamese staple and transform it into something international that is now the hit in the Netherlands and hopefully I'll find it in the supermarkets in Jamaica because just the just to see that you can smoke cassava to make a porridge I mean that sounds ever so delicious we don't have it yet in Jamaica so please let's figure out a way that we can get it in Jamaica um, this we project um, I'm going to use we as a short form has been life changing, of course, not just for the women involved, but also their families. The success of this project has given women newfound financial freedom. I'm sure Tanya is going to tell us about that and independence. And this is a very important aspect of Im improving women's lives, lives and empowering them to contribute to their economic well being. The women have not only been able to feed their families, renovate their homes, and some have purchased appliances for the first time. Congratulations. For others, it has opened new business ventures and the opportunity to see and experience the world differently. And what an amazing thing that is, that once we open up our eyes to the possibilities of what's going on around us, it's not just our little village, it's actually the whole world that you're connected to. So this is a really exciting 
uh, tribute, and I'm so proud of you, Tanya, and the WE group. Um, what I want to remind everybody today in this discussion is that in Latin America and the Caribbean, only 1% of all of our fem female entrepreneurs have access to angel investors. So angel investors are those people we go to when the banks are shutting the door, when somebody's taking a chance on us. Chance on us. Not just angel investors, but only 1% can access seed capital or venture capital funds. And three sources of funding that can enable a business idea to become a reality. So if only 1% of all of our female entrepreneurs have access to these three channels, then as you can see, the, it's a very, very, very narrow uh, door and corridor to walk in. Um, so with, with, even with that uh, barrier, the fact that you've been able to do what you've done has been tremendous. Just to contrast that, I mean, not that with men it's, it, it's tremendously different, but it's seven times the amount, right? So 7% of men have access to these three, three avenues of, of capital, but women do not. So that's an important thing to stress. Also, women tend to fund their businesses with personal resources or funding from family and friends. Um, I recall a few years ago at a IDB event, I can't even remember which, which uh, meeting it was now, but somebody will remember that I was on a panel and we were talking about access to finance and how women in the Caribbean typically finance their firms. And by the way, not just women, but also men. We borrow from family. We start a partner group. In the Bahamas, it's called, a, it's, it's called a ASU. In Jamaica, it's called a SUSU. But we all have some variation of that financing arrangement that came from our, our slave uh, backgrounds. And that still continues today. That's an important form of informal finance for many people who start businesses. While men can often dedicate themselves full time to building the networks needed to carry out their projects, women spend less time on their businesses to take care of their families because they have to take care of their families and households. And shall I say that during this pandemic, one of the consistent uh, reports, findings that we got from every single survey that we carried out is that women continue to bear the brunt of the household chores, whether it's looking after the children or cooking or the elderly, whatever, um, in, in, in addition to trying to hang on to their work, because some of us can now work from home, they also have these other responsibilities. So I want you to see how complicated this is. Um, but I think what, what is so interesting again to highlight is how this project proves that we can come together to find innovative solutions to ensure that all women can can take their place in, in the world of business and commerce. And, and I'm so, having been to Suriname a few times, um, I know what we would have had to go through to be successful and, I, and I'm, I'm really proud of that. We can also learn from, from WE's um, just the adaptiveness and the innovation in the whole project. Uh, the cooperative was formed during a period of great need and crisis. It led the women to come together to improve cassava farming to get more from the traditional value chain. I mean, the fact that we're even using value chain with additional product is already impressive enough. I wanna compare this to a similar project in Jamaica where Red Stripe, the beer producer in Jamaica, through an IDB facility as well, was able to convert cassava, the starch from cassava, into the beer process in Jamaica. And um, I wanna say that cassava producers all over this region, region are now very, very much in high demand and we want to see you continue to thrive. Um, others have mentioned that these products are now in 100 supermarkets all over the Netherlands. I would like to see it again in Jamaica, in the Bahamas, in Barbados, all of the, the, our, our whole chain. Um, I just want to congratulate you again. The three questions I want to leave with for this discussion are the following. Are there opportunities to create resilient value chains within the region? I think we know the answer to that, but if we can put on paper some real hot, high issues that we can deal with there to make this come to life. How can we transfer the learning and skills from groups like we to other countries to empower vulnerable groups? Already we're beginning to see where there can be parallels um, with the Jamaica cassava growers that I mentioned. How can we in the IDB identify and support indigenous projects that have exponential potential for growth and improving lives. And, and, and I want to say about this particular group in Suriname, 
you know, we have, we know that there are similar communities in Guyana, for example. So how can we connect these communities, these indigenous communities together so that we can see even um, more of these uh, projects proliferating and doing really well throughout the region. Congratulations again to we, Fu, well, we, Uma, Fu, Shranan. <laughs> That's the last time I'm going to say it. Um, we, we, the women of Suriname, congratulations. You really are our super, superheroes this afternoon and congratulations. I'm, uh, I hope you continue to pivot and that uh, this pandemic does not deter you from doing even greater things. Thank you so much. And thank you to our partners in IFD, uh, Gonzalo and Elizabeth and others from WeConnect for, for putting on this, this event this afternoon. Thank you. Well, thank you, Therese. Uh, so now uh, I have the pleasure to present our keynote speaker. She is Elizabeth, Elizabeth Vasquez. Uh, she's a leader in women's economic empowerment and global supplier diver diversity and inclusion. And she is also the co-author of the book, uh, Buying for Impact, How to Buy from Women and Change Our World. And she's also the CEO and co-founder of We Connect International. So welcome, Elizabeth, and the floor is yours. Thank you so much for the warm welcome. It's really an honor to get to be with all of you. I want to thank the women, first and foremost, for taking the risks every day that you take <laughs> to start and grow these businesses and support your families and your communities. I'm always in awe. Um, but of course, the IDB, she has been a wonderful partner to We Connect International and the Women Business Centers of the World and the Japanese Social Fund for their dedication and support for women as business owners and as pillars of global value chains in the Caribbean. And uh, I also just want to thank them for recognizing the important role of women uh, in value chains as business owners and uh, to the leaders of the WE program. Uh, for everything you're doing to make sure that uh, the women of the Suriname, you know, are able to reach their full potential. Uh, we really need their help. And so um, promoting the economic empowerment of women by promoting their presence in global value chains is truly one of the best, most sustainable ways to get money into the hands of women. And that's really important because of the way women spend their money and the way they grow their businesses and how they hire people. Uh, and so, you know, this is something that is, yes, it has social impact, but it's just simply good business. And uh, I feel very fortunate to get to represent a nonprofit that was created by many of the world's largest buyers and many of them sourcing in agriculture, um, either directly or indirectly, uh, whether it's PepsiCo uh, or working with um, the Cargills of the world, but then the Walmarts and um, the Sodexos, you know, all of them needing um, the products that uh, women in agricultural in the agricultural sector offer. So this is a a global NGO. Um, we these buyers uh, spend billions and billions and billions of dollars on products and services every year. Uh, women represent about a third of the world's private businesses, um, but unfortunately, they represent only about 1% of the suppliers uh, to very large organizations. And uh, that's something that we have to all work together uh, to fix because it just doesn't make sense. Um, it's a, it's a, a, a misuse and an underutilization of important resources and brain power and passion and commitment and ability. And so the women business centers we get to work with, they can self-register for free. So we make it very, very easy. And we have women business owners on the WeConnectInternational.org website um, in our uh, WE community. We just launched in 10 languages with USAID and many corporations, uh, SAP and others. Uh, but these women are based in 125 countries. And so all of them are able to now find each other and do business together and share their best practices, uh, their challenges and uh, their opportunities. And so it's, it's an exciting time to be a woman who owns a business. I know it's also very overwhelming at this particular moment um, because of COVID and all that comes with it and how very difficult it is to be able to access 
current markets, let alone new markets. And so there's um, a significant urgency that we're all working with uh, right now um, more, than, more than ever. And so um, you're all a part of that process. You're demonstrating every day your resiliency and your ability uh, to make things happen in spite of these challenges, how to leverage technology um, and just constantly reinvent yourself um, to continue to be relevant uh, to everyone around you. And so uh, this goal of connecting these women and businesses with buyers is extremely important. And it's, it's not just that the women need access to markets. These buyers desperately need innovative products and services uh, to support the, their customers. And so the role of women in agriculture is, is significant around the world. It's one of the largest, if not the largest sector. Uh, and women have historically um, you know, worked the land and created the crops that we all enjoy and sustain us, literally keeping us alive. Uh, and the role of cassava in all of that um, is, is significant. Um, not just the cassava porridge, um, but the, you know, the deliciousness of tapioca, which is, happens to be one of my most favorite comfort foods. My mom would always make that for us, whether something was really good or really bad. It was tapioca that we all enjoyed together. So that's one of my most favorite comfort foods in the whole wide world. And I'm grateful for the women who make that possible. Um, and so I, I think, I just feel like this program is such a, important example of what could be done, what can be done when we all come together and recognize the value uh, that the women of cassava um, provide to their communities, but to the rest of the world as role models. And um, I, I think there are going to increasingly be opportunities to look beyond uh, cassava as something that we consume to sustain ourselves. Um, I, I'm not an expert, but I do work with the oil and gas industry. And I do know that there are some really exciting things coming out with uh, cassava being turned into industrial lubricants that actually help to make the machinery work. Um, but do it in a way that's sustainable um, with something that's biodegradable. And we need more of that. We need a lot more of that. Uh, so really looking forward to seeing what the IDB um, with their mandate and focus on innovation and the women's focus on uh, innovation, you know, what we come up with together. And so I'm mostly here to learn and to listen. Um, I'm excited to, to get to meet Tanya and uh, to learn about the uh, wonderful work that she and all the women of the community are doing. And um, I thank you again for allowing me to be a part of this conversation. And I thank all of you for, for the impact you're having on the lives of women and, and, the, and the people that women serve. Thank you. Well, thank you, Elizabeth. <clears throat> uh, now it's uh, time to meet uh, our superhero in Suriname, Tanya, uh, Tanya Lua Soy. Uh, and she will be sharing with us the story on how one manager project that strengthened the entrepreneurial ecosystem place like uh, Broco Pondo, Wanika, uh, Sipalawini, and Marawinje. <laughs> so many words that I can't pronounce, but every, uh, every, every one of them uh, uh, is supposed to uh, represent uh, a, a, a particular community in the interior of Suriname. So uh, Tanya, uh, please help me here out. Thank you. And congratulations Thank again. <laughs> Thank you very much, uh, Gonzalo. And uh, good afternoon, uh, President Carone, Mr. Shimichi, Mrs. Elizabeth, Mrs. Teresa. Before I go on, first of all, thank you very much for having me and uh, the opportunity to share our story. But before I go on, as I said, when we won the Superhero 2020, I don't see myself as a superhero because with me alone, there wouldn't be a superhero uh, for Suriname. So I brought along with me two powerful women from the board. On my left, you will see the co-chair and on my right is commissioner from the board. And these are the women, the pioneers uh, that started this with me together. I would have liked to have many more women here, but 
you know, COVID is still around. So uh, let me allow me to share our story with you. Although many of what we've done uh, has already been said, but I, I guess it's nice to hear it from us. As you all know, my, na my name is Tanya Liwasu, and I'm the president of a women agriculture cooperative, We Uma Fusranang, translated as We, the women of Suriname. Uh, incidentally, I'm also the president of the Suriname Network of Rural Women Producers, and that is a local uh, chapter of the Caribbean Network of Rural Women Producers, CANROP. Our cooperative started in uh, 2013 and was formed to a bottom-up approach in a period of great crisis and need. Um, the women has, most of the women are from the interior and they have limited income generating opportunities. Farming is their only source of income and primarily they plan for their own consumption and the surplus is being sold as a source of income. The main crop that these women uh, grow is cassava, and this is a staple in the interior. To increase our income, we decided to develop and to market the product together. We chose a well-known product made by the Amer Indians and the Maroon as a baby food, and that is the smoked cassava porridge, and the name is Kokori. Most people in the interior have been raised with this porridge, but unfortunately, it had fallen into a forgotten corner because of the convenience of imported baby products available on the market today. Through hard work and determination, we were able to position the porridge in the market as a revived and innovative pre-packed porridge for babies and elderly. And very soon this product started to get publicity and we were able to get our products onto the shelves of over hundred supermarkets in Suriname. And yes, even the IDB, heard about the work done by us and showed great interest. After a visit to the village by the IDB and a consultant from Japan, the delegation was sold on the ID and offered us their support through a technical cooperation project. Although most of the women has little to no formal education, the project from the IDB gave them the opportunity to strengthen their knowledge and their capacity. They learned about the good agriculture practices, the good hygiene practices, but most importantly, what a value chain is, how it's being developed and what the role each of these women plays in the cassava porridge value chain. Due to the focus on the GAP and GHP training in the past years, the women involved in this project adopted new production processes. And building on this training, it is expected that certifications in the, tar in the targeted international standards like Global GAP and FSSC 22000 will be achieved during 2021. Our facility has already been uh, renovated in conformity with the required certification standards. And it was, this was made possible by part of the project and also collaboration with the military force in Suriname. The project made it possible that innovation is being implemented and WIF has as Mrs. Teresa calls, was nice, and that is our brand, We, and I will use the brand name now, We, has explored some product innovations such as the development of baby formula made from 90% local inputs with a cassava base, which could be made available at a fraction of the cost of baby formulas being used in Suriname, being sold in Suriname. For the scientific validation, WIFS, has we has received technical assistance of two product developers from the POM, the Netherlands, in the Netherlands, and food technologist and a mechanical engineer. This development is aimed to transform the food system to a more sustainable one. And through the marketing component of the project, eight of the women were able to travel to the Netherlands and to participate in a huge festival which took place over four weekends in a row. And this activity was also supported by uh, another partner of ours, the ICA. They had the opportunity to market their products, to interact with the visitors and to learn how to sell their traditional knowledge and to be proud of it. This event was a super eye opener for most of the women who had never been in an airplane before and were so grateful 
because they had never dreamed of an opportunity to travel to the Netherlands ever. But most importantly, they were able to see the required standards of the products in the supermarkets. They now understand better what, uh, uh, that we cannot settle for less, what the expected standards of the products are. And due to this event, we succeeded to sign an agreement with a company who will distribute our products in the Netherlands. The project created tremendous opportunity for the women. And yes, rural women can be part of a global value chain. We have proved that again. We are very hopeful that our products will be positioned, well positioned in a growing gluten-free market globally. It has all the potential to do so, especially now that we have an innovative gluten-free cassava pancake mix. And for the Netherlands, we're coming with the poverty mix. <laughs> The women also benefit from the income of the end products and not only from the primary production, and that's very important. And yes, then came COVID-19. COVID-19 forced us to think outside the box and did not stop us. We replaced classroom training for GAP and GHP with the development of five-minute animation videos that can be run on all the women's smartphones, because yes, they have a smartphone. <laughs> so COVID-19 also created opportunities for us. The awareness and demand for the use of local products is increasing, and so are our sales. Our cooperative is now an example in the Surinamese society. We are well known and earned a place at the table. Because of all the publicity, the women have a voice now. They meet with decision makers, with ministers, and even presidents, and their opinion is being heard and respected. We therefore plead, and this is important, for support for the other women in Suriname and the Caribbean and Latin America, because I know that they have great opportunities, great ideas, and with the, with the support of, in this case, the IDB or Japan, these women can have the same opportunities as we to change their life for the better. We is willing to share their experience and gain knowledge to ease the road for the other women. And before I conclude, may I use this opportunity to thank the IDB and Japan, but in particular, the staff of the IDB at our country office and our team leader, thanking them for finding us and showing interest in our work. And most of all, that they offered us their support to change our life and our livelihood forever. I say this because we started our joint activities through a bottom-up approach and we were very weak, still very weak in the state when the IDB found us and reached out their hand. And this is commendable. I thank the country representative for his promise to support the women in the process of financial inclusion. And we hope that we may have a long-standing relationship with the bank. And yes, WIFS has a dream. And our next dream is to establish a product development facility in a joint venture with the government, research institutes and universities, local and international, which will support all the small entrepreneurs with their bright ideas to develop their ideas into a marketable product. And we hope that our dream may come true very soon. May I thank you all for your attention and the opportunity to share our story with you. Thank you. Thank you, thank you very much, Tanya. Uh... Uh, it was uh, very inspiring, and, uh, and there is a lot of questions that uh, I would like to, to put forward, uh, both to you and to Elizabeth. Uh, so, but let me start saying something that is, uh, is very exciting for me, that I have been working in this uh, for many years. I, I always been pressing about the idea of uh, technological transfer and the possibility of people, you know, from different parts of the world to go to see in person uh, how things are done in, in, in parts of the world that uh, do these things uh, in, in a very well uh, way, no? And, and to learn from experience. And, and, and many times I, I, I face these uh, oppositions that people say, 
why is that we with public resources are paying people to travel <laughs> as if we're just leisure travel you know and, uh, and you have explained very well the importance of uh, you know having the possibility of uh, going there and see how things uh, are done so uh, thank you for that because i will use your experience in in, in other projects <laughs> so uh i would like to start um uh, with something that Therese mentioned about this idea of uh, uh, is it possible to transfer this experience uh, uh, to other supply chains in, 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 in the Caribbean? Uh, what are the main challenges that uh, SMEs face uh, for this? But I would like to start with Elizabeth asking that, and then uh, perhaps we we'll, uh, can go back to you, uh, Celia. So Elizabeth. What are your words thought about, about this uh, possibility that uh, Therese mentioned? Thank you, Gonzalo. And I think as uh, Tanya and Teresa have noted, uh, there's not an easy answer and every sector is different, every country is different, every community is different. Um, having said that, um, I think the first step is what is happening right now, which is a mindset shift. Um, you know, how do we think really big, uh, think local, but, um, you know, act locally, but think globally. And so um, shifting our mindsets, women tend to focus on low cost to entry sectors, uh, but they also tend to have low profit potential. And we also tend to focus on consumer facing businesses. And that's fine, but there are ways to um, scale consumer facing businesses, especially when you look at having a B2B business um, that uh, is a retailer for um, fa uh, consumer facing products and you can get into those larger value chains. Um, so how do you sell to a Walmart um, if you ha uh, produce cassava? Well, you're going to have to knock on a lot of doors um, to find buyers that are convinced um, that you've done your homework about what it is they source and what those standards are, that you've worked to make sure you're, you achieve those health and quality standards, industry standards, that you can deliver things that are on time uh, and have very consistent quality um, batch after batch uh, and can demonstrate that, that you understand um, those concerns and that you have the ability and the willingness to invest in yourselves um, and your uh, team to uh, be able to scale with them so that as they uh, request larger orders that you're able to fulfill those orders. And so that is the, the growth path to being able to scale and it's not easy. So starting with where you are and the access you have to prove that you can sell a high quality product with the right price points, the right packaging, and then figure out how do you get into those larger one-to-many sales opportunities and move into barcoding uh, and everything else that has to be done to be able to compete uh, locally, nationally, and globally. Um, you know, that's, I hear the beginnings of that and, you know, clear examples of the ability to do this. And so the only question now is how do you uh, start to, to uh, build on the current investments um, with an eye towards uh, scale uh, and competitiveness uh, beyond local opportunities. So it's um, all the basics are there. And uh, I think it's uh, Tanya, I mean, you're the person who's doing it with all of your, your colleagues. No one does this alone, I know, uh, but it does take really strong leadership. So I really defer to you on your vision for how, how do you uh, expand all the great things that are already happening. Uh, go ahead, Tanya. Oh, um, yes, indeed. Um, it is a long, hard road, Elizabeth. But um, I think that if you're committed and if you if you see the opportunities, acknowledge the opportunities um, to change people's life, the opportunities that if we get there at the end of the tunnel and put everything that's needed in place because it is a mouthful. First of all, we are not in a hurry. Um, we, we, I, it is definitely a process. The, I know that globally there are standards being required. Um, the biggest challenge is to teach these women to adapt these standards and why they are necessary 
and it's constantly uh, training, creating awareness. But the minute that you demonstrate to them, and, and that is the challenge, they should know and see and experience the, that physically um, and tangibly it will change their life, then they are willing to adapt. And you know how it goes. Once a woman is willing to adapt, the road after that is easy. Uh, just compare it with a woman who will give birth the first time. <laughs> it, the children doesn't come with a manual, okay? But we do it. So I think that women are created with the ability to adapt new processes. And once they understand and they, they, they are comfortable with it and they know that it will improve their life, um, they are willing to, to make that change. Um, but besides that, it is, yes, it is, it, it is a lot of work. It is uh, uh, day and night working, um, but partnerships, uh, we has a lot of great partners, um, uh, like like the ICA, like uh, consultants in Suriname, which became addicted because of our journey. So they support us uh, at no cost, and we can knock on their doors. And uh, yes, we need that knowledge, we need that support. Um, but it is not impossible to make these changes and to adapt all these rules and regulations uh, to be able to, to export and position our products globally. As a matter of fact, we have proven that we are there. Uh, we are now in the process of um, the FSSC 22,000 certification. And for people who knows that, is the highest certification you get, can get if it comes to processing and, and the pro processing the um, facility. In Suriname, there are only two companies with that uh, um, certification, and we are determined to demonstrate that we will be the third. So yes, it's a it's a lot of efforts, determination, perseverance, but it isn't impossible. And if all people uh, join forces and know, I always say that improving these women's life is an addiction. Just try it, believe me, after that, when you do it once and you, and you meet them and you see how, how their life has changed, they can send their children to school, they become proud women, they, you know, they speak with presidents, with ministers. It is, it is unbelievable how this changed. And, and for us, it is not uh, impossible and we are willing. It is a hard journey, a long journey, but we are willing to share this with, with other women and they, they have the same ability to do the same that we are doing now. Uh, thank you, Tanya. Uh, well, you know that uh, IDB and uh, most of our work, uh, particularly in, 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 in our divisions uh, from the sector vice presidency, it works with governments. Uh, actually, we, we deal with them, uh, we loan money to establish programs, etc. So. Uh, we, we are always trying to help them to devise public policies that could help, can help, uh, you know, to boost uh, productive development and value uh, chain, etc. So, uh, first to you and then to Elizabeth, how would, would be your recommendation concerning what government through public policies uh, could do in order to help uh, the kind of initiative that uh, you, uh, you have uh, been uh, you know, uh, leading. Uh, to you, Tanya. Oh, to me. Yeah, yeah. First um, you, and then Elizabeth. <laughs> sorry. Oh, sorry, I <laughs> Elizabeth. Sorry, sorry, sorry. It's um, okay. It's okay. Yes, I, I, I thought about that as well, and I, I have specific um, points from which I think that I can share. Um, where support from either the IDB or uh, the government maybe jointly can, can be offered. Um, I think that we, we are looking at differentiated policies which target rural women for access to credit, incentives for importation of equipment and material for their micro businesses. It's very important. Um, women are doing a lot of labor, uh, 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 
a lot of work, a lot, they are processing, they are doing a lot of work, but most of it is manually and access to finance and access to actually uh, uh, equipment to, so that they can, can upgrade their standards, their values is a huge problem and it states a, a, a huge problem. So I think that if um, IDB, the government, look at some possibilities to, to open uh, facilities for these women, I think it will be of uh, much help. Um, I think that specific support for testing of agro-processed products, which often have to be done out of countries or uh, at exorbitant high prices. And this is beyond the reach of small entrepreneurs. And that is why I spoke about the dream from we for this uh, development facility, pro product development facility. Um, the support in, in purchasing of bulk for the producer groups is for raw materials is, is very important because this will lower the price. Um, but I also think that um, the support to forming organizations uh, for an entrepreneurship and to facilitate the legal processing uh, and associated timelines. Um, but one thing that I will definitely give as a recommendation while um, formulating uh, 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 projects is that uh, many times there are very good projects implemented, but a lack of support aftercare support um, and, and, and some guidance after the project is most of the time missing. And that is something that uh, we really need to look at. And the IDB and the government can, can play a very important role in that. Thank you, Tanya. Uh, Elizabeth, please. I mean, really, uh, Tanya just <laughs> outlined exactly the things that I, I would have also said. So, uh, you know, the government plays a unique role in the world, uh, in their communities. Uh, they're the single largest buyer of products and services. Their role is to create an enabling environment, but they collect taxes from the people, the men and women of the country. And I think the government has an obligation and an opportunity to look at how the government spends its money. And if any of it is being spent on um, all of the people of, of the community that it is supposed to serve. And so I would look first and foremost at what is it the government is buying and, and do they have initiatives in place to feed their own people, right? The, the public servants who, who work for the government and do they eat cassava? I'm guessing they do. And the, the, any programs or initiatives to feed the children? I'm guessing that they do have some programs to do that um, within the school systems. Um, and people who don't have access to food, um, I'm guessing they also have some support systems in place. And so they have significant purchasing power uh, that they can leverage uh, with the communities they care about, but also need help from. Uh, so this is a great example um, where the government's going to buy things anyway. Why not buy local? Uh, and so their job is also obviously to create the enabling environment, make sure that uh, the women who run these organizations have a trained workforce that is well educated um, and numerate uh, and uh, literate and um, support for the NGOs that uh, rarely have enough money uh, to, to do the basics, um, let alone take full responsibility for training the workforce and supporting the workforce. So um, just as uh, Tanya said, that all of these things are, um, I think, obvious roles uh, for the, the public sector. Um, and in addition, the public sector has um, relationships with other countries. Um, and the multilaterals. So to the degree they can make introductions to help facilitate international trade opportunities and access to markets. Um, this is a really important role of government that is hard to do for small businesses and certainly for cooperatives and collaboratives. Uh, so I think those are, um, you know, it's a short list. There's a lot to be done, uh, but certainly the government, especially creating public private partnerships and working with important uh, enablers such as the IDB um, and the local organizations um, that the women have created. I think this is, this is the way we show that uh, we're all better off when we collaborate and don't try to do it on our own. 
Uh, Thank you, Elizabeth. I, I would like to, uh, well, there is a little time uh, still, so I would like also, Elizabeth, to ask you about uh, something that already Tania mentioned about a little, and, and these are the challenges that uh, represent the, uh, the pandemic, no? Uh, mm. For adjusting the, the, the businesses, uh, adjusting, uh, and Perez also mentioned the, the question of uh, uh, resiliency. No, uh, how to build up a resiliency in, in, in value chains and, and how to also, in, in particular case of uh, women uh, uh, running business, this um, uh, enorm enormous burden that is uh, represented uh, sometimes uh, to combine both uh, the challenges of, uh, you know, uh, uh, running the household. Uh, there are many women that uh, are the, the only person that in, are in charge of uh, uh, you know everything uh, uh, in the families uh, they are leading their families actually but uh, they are they are also trying to lead their businesses so uh, how do you see these uh, these challenges uh, particularly in the in, in, in the in the moment of the pandemic and what have you can tell us about the experience that you have seen uh, uh, Elizabeth Thank you for asking. And again, I'm going to defer to Tanya to say, because they're showing us the, the how to get through this. Uh, but from the, the surveys we've done with the women business owners in our network in every region of the world, um, there are some basics that distinguish the businesses that are thriving in this environment and the ones that are still having a hard time or unable to survive. Um, the ones that seem to be thriving are the ones that are willing and able to make um, real-time investments in pivoting their business models and what it is they offer, uh, the products, the services based on the needs around them and, and being very proactive in trying to anticipate those needs, which women are so uniquely positioned in our communities to be able to anticipate needs um, because we know firsthand what's working and what's not working, um, but we don't necessarily have the resources to quickly develop product and service solutions. Um, but it's not because we're not capable of doing that. We are, and in fact, I think, uh, was it Churchill that said, never let a good crisis go to waste? And you know, we really have to rethink about how we did things in the past, because I hear a lot of people saying, I can't wait for things to go back to normal, but normal didn't work for women in general. Uh, we did a lot of work, but we weren't getting paid for it. You know, we keep volunteering, hoping it's going to change and someone's going to recognize the value we're providing. Um, but at the end of the day, we also have our own purchasing power and we need to start spending our money with other women owned businesses to lead by example um, and empower each other and lift each other up and, and support the great men who are out there who believe in inclusion. Um, and who believe that all of us deserve an equal opportunity to contribute to and benefit from inclusive prosperity. Um, and so I, I think I see this as, as much of a crisis, um, equally as much as an opportunity to rebuild in a way that is just better for everyone. But um, Tanya, I'll definitely defer to you. Uh, thank you, Elizabeth. And uh, before you uh, defer, Tanya, uh, may I add, a question that is here in the in the chat uh, for you, Tanya, and it's basically they are asking uh, if you can, you know, share with us some of the challenges that you face with uh, scaling up uh, to commercial operation at the business. Uh, how did you get the equipment? Uh, how did you build the factory, etc., cetera, etc.? Cetera. So, I, I guess that uh, there are people here that are very interested in trying to run something <laughs> so uh, powerful as uh, you have uh, with your team. So uh, if you can share with them, that, that will be very nice. Um, yes, um, many times uh, I've got this question uh, in Suriname to motivate other people. And there are definitely three things before I tell you how we got all these funds, etc. There are definitely three things that I always tell them. First of all, um, I believe in a God and I believe in a higher power. Um, second of all, and, and this higher power is always on our side. Second of all, all I, I believe in our ability and that we all have a purpose in life. And if you find your purpose in life, you, can, you actually can perform with the best of your abilities, the best in you will come out. And third of all, perseverance. Um, 
you know, when people are asking me to tell the story, I sometimes get scared because I don't want them to think that it was it, that it's a fairy tale because it isn't a fairy tale. It wasn't a fairy tale. Um, but yes, I do believe that if you're if you're determined uh, in, in what you're doing, um, and in the in the, the the beginning stage, we had a lot of problems. People who were skeptic, people who actually tried to destroy uh the 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 join of of these women but believing in what you're doing um you finally will be at a point that it will take a spin and that is what happened because we went from 50 participants to three and actually i thought that i'm crazy and these two women behind me were the one who actually powered me to go on and we went to a complete different village that wasn't part of the beginning. Mm -hmm. So um, we, we worked for, I think, almost two years um, with little that we had. We had no money. The only thing that we had was uh, a little bit from everybody and, and the determination to do something big. And that is what we joined together. Um, and that time when we started, I think around 2016, there was a uh, huge uh, economic crisis in Suriname. And we were able uh, in 2015 to put our product in this innovative package uh, on, the, on the market shelf. And on a certain point when everybody was complaining that we have no money because th those are the, the things that you will hear constantly, no money um, and, and, and no support. Uh, we thought that it was the time that we have a big launch <laughs> and we invited the entire um, government, the opposition, the coalition, the president, the, the ministers, everybody to come and see what these women were able to accomplish with no money, but with faith and trust in what they are doing. And as I said in my pitch, that is when IDB also heard of us and came to the interior with a, a consultant from Japan. You know, it is a fact that people want to be part of a success story. And whenever you reach that, that turning point that you have established something and you have proven that it makes sense, then you will get people on your side who wants to be part of that story. Um, but we had a lot of friends and I said it before and I will say it again, we had a lot of friends. It started with the biggest support from the IDB and Japan. Um, but beside that, we have friends like the Ika who has a lot of agriculture knowledge uh, who is supporting the, the women from Kenra. Um, we have like the EU he, who heard about us who the ICA also requested to come and join us and see, and, and they actually bought our first grating equipment. But you know what, when you're, um, wh when you believe in what you're doing and you make adequate use of the help you're getting, people will be very pleased to go on and help you to the next level. And that is what happened. Um, after, and I think that the basic is developing a, a, a value chain and understanding what the development of a value chain is, because I think that this is, this is the way forward. We need to explain to all these people who are uh, producers or processors what a value chain, even the government should start to learn what a value chain development is, because believe me, they do not know. <laughs> and if you understand that and you know the role that all these components, all these links are playing in developing this chain, then I think that you will know better how to move forward. So it, while we were in that process, came along a project of um, the EU, for example, who is now a partner of us uh, as well. And we knew that what we are leaking now to um, actually make process the high volumes is equipment and finance. 
plain and simple. So we um, wrote a proposal. We have a project going on in Suriname, a sum up that's from the EU. We wrote a proposal and believe it or not, uh, we came out with the highest points in this proposal to uh, <laughs> be awarded the equipment to go forward. And I say that because this, because I want to encourage everybody. Uh, we know that we are in a developing country. We know that we cannot go to the bank because of the high rates to borrow money. So there are developing partners. I know that a lot of people are impatient, but we started in 2013. We are now in 2020 and see what the process is. And yet it was like we started yesterday. <laughs> it takes time. Yeah, you, you mentioned that it's a process. So well, thank you. Uh, we are running out of time. Uh, I want to congratulate again, we. And, um, and uh, I want to thank you, Tanya. Thank you, Elizabeth. Thank you, uh, uh, Director Chimisu, Therese, and our President, Mauricio Claver Caron, and all uh, the person that uh, made possible this uh, uh, event today, and particularly uh, Michael Hennessy, who was uh, the guy who was working from our division with you. So uh, thank you again. And uh, it was real pressure to hear this uh, successful story. And we all hope that this will be just one of uh, much more, many more. OK, That's thank fine. you. And uh, thank have a good so evening. Much. Thank you. Bye bye. Bye bye.